On, on behalf of the um, McLean Center uh, for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Center for Health and the Social Sciences, um, Dr. Meltzer and I are delighted to welcome you to this lecture in the 2018-19 series on improving value in the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, I'm so happy to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Albert Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang uh, is professor of medicine here at the university and serves as director of the Center for Chronic Disease Research and Policy. He's also the associate director of the Chicago Center uh, for Diabetes Translation Research. From 2010 to 2011, uh, Elbert served as a senior advisor in the office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Elbert is a primary care doctor who studies clinical and health care policy issues at the intersection of diabetes, aging, and health economics. Using methods from health economics, he's performed seminal translational diabetes research studies, including a well-known 2008 widely cited study that forecasted the growth in the diabetes population and related health care costs over the ensuing 25 years. Uh, Elbert Wang has also led economic evaluations of community-based diabetes initiatives, uh, clinic quality improvement programs, new diabetes technologies, such as continuous glucose monitoring, as well as the application of basic scientific discoveries like genetic testing uh, to, to clinical diabetes care. Um, Dr. Wang has received numerous honors. Uh, they include the Research Paper of the Year Award from the Society of General Internal Medicine, and he's been elected a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Today, uh, Dr. Wang's talk is entitled, as you see behind me, Finding Value in Innovations in Diabetes Care. Um, in, in a brief um, uh, conversation that I had with Elbert just before this introduction, um, Elbert tells me that this is a talk, and do I have it right, that's never quite been given in its entirety before. So we're very excited and looking forward to it. Join me in giving a warm welcome to Albert Wang. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Great. So um, the outline for this talk is kind of a march through the history of diabetes care and the associated economic studies that we've been part of along the way. So I'll review sort of the general public health and public policy challenges that we face using diabetes as a chronic, a, a model chronic condition. Um, and I'll talk about, uh, basically march through a review of innovations in diabetes prevention and care that have happened over the last 15 to 20 years. And then I'll review uh, uh, efforts to characterize the economic value of these innovations over time. So, uh, Bear with me, you've seen this a million times, but it's still dramatic every time I see this. So this is the rate of, these are, this is the prevalence of diabetes starting back in uh, 2005, and we basically marched through time. Um, the darker and deeper the red, the more diabetes there is in the country. Um, I'd say 20 to 30 years ago, we had a prevalence of diabetes around five, uh, maybe three to five percent, and we're now uh, nationally at a prevalence of around uh, eight to nine percent. So nearly a, a one out of 10 people in the United States has uh, diabetes. And let's see if I can speed up through time. There's 2010, and these, uh, you can sort of see that there's geographic uh, disparities in the prevalence of diabetes. Here's 2015, the most recent year. Um, a lot of the country is uh, deeply red with uh, diabetes prevalence rates above 9%. And this is from the Centers for Disease Control. So um, there are uh, a lot of epidemics. Uh, uh, I mean, this, this is actually concurrent with the, the opioid epidemic, but the obesity and diabetes epidemic have been, has been um, going along uh, at the same time for the, over the same time period. So a fairly devastating growth of uh, this uh, common chronic disease. And part of this has to do with 
a steep rise in, the, so that was the prevalent diabetes, so how many people have diabetes at a given point in time. And the reason that the prevalence of diabetes has risen so much is because the incidence of diabetes, that's the rate of new cases of diabetes, has also uh, has, has, uh, shot up. In particular, between the 19, in, in the, sometime in the 1990s to early 2000s, there was a st steep increase in the rate of the incidence of diabetes uh, that you can see uh, yeah, from here to here. And it appears to have uh, lessened a bit, the, the rising incidence has lessened a bit since 2010. So if, um, uh, so in, in, in the late 2000s, um, Anur Banbasu and I actually developed a forecasting model of, uh, that, that accounted for the new entry of people with diabetes and uh, uh, their, their life course, so it included their exit from the system as well, and uh, tracked um, uh, overlapping cohorts of people as they entered with diabetes over time. And this is our projection of how many people will have di prevalent diabetes um, from, from, I think, 2009 to 2035. And uh, we're right now around here, um, around uh, 30 million people around 2020, and we'll see whether or not our numbers are about right. And typically, these forecast studies are historically always wrong. Um, they're right typically in terms of the direction of growth, but they're always off in terms of the magnitude of growth. Um, but um, these are, we projected that the population size would nearly double from around 23 million to nearly 40 million people uh, over the next 30 years. And these are the associated costs of care for different generations of people entering with diabetes at different time periods um, and uh, causing this dramatic increase. And in, while the population size is projected to double, the cost of taking care of these people is projected to triple during that same period of time. Now, when we did that forecasting study, we actually didn't even, we assumed that rates of diabetes and uh, the rate of entry into diabetes would be frozen in time. That what we saw in 2007 would just continue. And so a lot of this growth is actually due to just the aging of the population and um, shifting demographics. Um, and this assumes also a, f a fixed rate of obesity of around 30%. Uh, which we may be, and the, the problem with all these is we may be wrong about each of these, uh, all, each of these assumptions. We also assumed the cost of medications would be roughly what it was in 2007 and that things would not change. So you can get a, sort of guess if you think through those three assumptions, we are likely wrong about the actual eventual cost of diabetes in the year 2030. So, we're actually not that far off. So this is a snapshot from the American Diabetes Association from 2018. We have around 30 million people in America, around 10% of the population with, uh, with diabetes. The vast majority is type two diabetes. So I'll talk a lot about different different classes and types of diabetes, uh, but 95% of people have what we call type 2 diabetes. And they cost the country around $327 billion in, uh, annually. Uh, that is a mixture of direct and indirect costs. If you just look at the direct costs of medical care, it's around $237 billion per year. Um, uh, uh, you know, David's in the audience, and he'll tell you this is actually not that big a number because actually, the, 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 you know, the overall size of the uh, of the uh, healthcare budget in America, uh, healthcare economy in America, is closer to two trillion. Is that right? So this is like, you know, it's. Three, it's around three trillion. So this is something, but you know, th you know, three hundred billion dollars is a lot of money, but it's all relative. So this is uh, what I alluded to earlier. So in that forecast that I showed you from, two, uh, from around 2007, 2008, we assumed that the costs of medications would be really static. We did not know uh, that this would happen. So this is a, a, a little research letter in JAMA that we published a couple of years ago um, that used um, the medical expenditure panel survey to just estimate how much the per capita costs of diabetes will change over time. So this accounts for not only um, the dose of medication people are receiving, but the kind of medicine, and it accounts for the changing price of medicines over time. So this is, so the average person taking insulin is depicted in the orange line, and the uh, and you can sort of see that uh, the straight line is actually the per capita cost of diabetes medications over time. It doesn't look too bad. It's around $600 per person. Um, and actually declines a little bit overall. 
because it's a mixture of all, you know, all the people with different kinds taking different kinds of medications. But what's striking is the rise in the uh, in annual um, per capita expenditure for insulin over the same time period. Um, so um, it goes from around $200 per person per year in 2002 to around um, $700 per person per year in, in 2013. So this is actually due to not only, um, uh, not only changing prices, which I'm going to talk about, but it actually it has to do with people actually, the actual, actual person using insulin is actually using more insulin today than they were in 2002. In other words, the average daily usage of insulin in terms of the units that we're dispensing per person per day has increased. But what had caught a lot of the people's attention is that the price of insulin for the same exact unit size has actually tripled during that time period. So the price of insulin went from $4.34 per milliliter in 2002 to $12.92 uh, uh, per milliliter in 2013. So it's a um, insulin pricing has become is um, is one of many examples of uh, a dramatic increase in price that we don't fully understand, or and is and I'll, I'll end the talk about how there's increasing scrutiny over the. Um, why these prices are going up and how they're affecting people. Part of this is due to the shift from human-based insulin to insulin analogs, which, uh, do we have endocrinologists in the, in the audience? Raise your hand if you're an endocrinologist. No, none of them showed up. So at endo uh, endocrinologists love the insulin analogs because they're, they're uh, modified versions of human insulin that allow us to, uh, to um, specifically time the, uh, the duration of effect of insulin and when their peak action is. Gives us a lot of control over how the insulin works. They're dramatically more expensive than human insulin, about ten, in some cases 10 times more expensive. So that's part of what's going on up here. So rising prices, uh, epidemic of disease. Um, now, all of, that, um, all of that is quite scary. But if you have diabetes today in 2019, you're uh, actually quite lucky to be alive with your diet. I mean, it's not lucky that you have the diabetes, but to have the diabetes now is a lot better to have diabetes from the 1970s or even earlier, a century earlier, when people died routinely of a very young death from diabetes. Um, so this shows you the rates of different complications. Once people have diabetes, what, the rate of, what has happened to trends in the rates of complications, for major cardiovascular events like heart attack, stroke, amputation, renal failure, and in general, the cardiovascular outcomes have undergone a steep decline in terms of uh, you're much less likely to have a heart attack or a stroke than you were in the 1990s. Um, and uh, the rates of other complications like renal failure have unfortunately been a little more stubborn and have not declined as much. Um, so at the, while we have uh, experienced an, a, an epidemic boom in the number of people with diabetes, the average person that we encounter who has diabetes is more likely to live longer, uh, to have a lower rate of cardiovascular outcomes than they were um, decades ago. In fact, actually, people with type 1 diabetes, these are individuals who have uh, to produce no insulin whatsoever um, and are dependent on insulin entire, in its enti in, 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 for, to, to survive, actually now have a life expectancy that's, that's a very similar to someone who doesn't have diabetes. David, you had a question? Yes. Yes. That's a very good question. So I've actually seen other, uh, other studies of the general population and rates of uh, cardiovascular outcomes. And they are overall. So I think the improvements in the diabetes population are part of overall improvements in cardiovascular prevention. But this bottom uh, graphic is actually an attempt to, uh, this actually is a mixture of people with and without diabetes. And the rates of, uh, there is some decline in, I think, MI, but it's, um, it's not, as, it's not as steep as what we see in people with diabetes. But um, you can guess what, what likely happened during this time. I, I, I believe it's very likely this is actually the statins. Um, and probably better management once people had lower less smoking and better management once people had coronary artery disease, uh, better procedures, all of that contributing to the decline. I don't, this is too early to be attributed to better glycemic control, I think. But 
possible. So if you have diabetes today, it's a lot better than it was several decades ago. So what do we do with this? We have very, you know, a huge growing population of people with uh, this chronic condition. We have very expensive care. But at the same time, it is, does appear to be producing benefits for the people who have the condition. And how do we judge the value of these innovations or changes in, in care? And so we've been, uh, you know, at University of Chicago, we have a, actually a long and proud tradition of being, of having a connection with the, um, with uh, the theoretical foundations of cost-effectiveness analysis um, in the United States. And um, this, is, this is a picture of three leading figures who, who have connections to the University of Chicago. Will Manning, who's unfortunately passed away, um, was actually on the original panel um, of, on cost-effectiveness in health and medicine. And basically, that was the original rule book that we used um, used to, uh, to conduct cost effectiveness analysis. Prior to the publication of that panel report, it was a real wild west of analysis where people kind of um, made up uh, uh, metrics and uh, outcomes and, and, and decided whether or not something was cost effective or not kind of on their own, uh, will help to establish the rule book for, for doing those analyses. And more recently, David Meltzer, who is here, and Anur Bas Basu, who was a graduate student of these two, uh, they were uh, co-authors of the recent uh, second version of the panel of uh, cost effectiveness of health and medicine, and that's published in this this issue of JAMA from 2016, and there's, a, I think, a more extensive report elsewhere. So the rule, hopefully we follow the rules that they set out uh, to, uh, in, in, our, in our evaluations. So um, you're going to have to, so I'm going to explain uh, just very briefly the cost effectiveness analysis method and the, and the basic metric that we, outcome metric that we use in interpreting all the subsequent analyses I'm going to uh, show to you. Uh, so the basic you know, synthetic metric of cost effectiveness analysis is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is a simple equation. It's the difference in costs of two different uh, options that you're comparing. It could be two treatments, it could be two policies, over the difference in an outcome um, uh, for the two different options. And in the, a, a version of cost effectiveness analysis that we call cost utility analysis is expressed in differences in cost over differences in quality just in life years. So I'm going to use this repeatedly uh, during the, the entirety of this talk. To interpret this, uh, this outcome, it's, it's actually typically best to look at both the difference in cost and the difference in outcomes separately in order to interpret them. Because if you just looked at the number, you wouldn't know where that result lands on what we call the cost effectiveness plane. On the cost effectiveness plane, the y-axis is the difference in cost for the two options. And on the x-axis is the difference in health outcomes uh, for the two outcomes. And we talk about the four quadrants uh, of the cost effectiveness plane when interpreting the result of a cost effectiveness analysis. Most intervention, most innovations in healthcare land in the northeast quadrant. And in this quadrant, costs are higher with the new innovation, but health outcomes are better. So we are typically interpreting results for, for things that make life better, but at higher costs. And um, that requires some sort of um, threshold in order to understand whether or not something is cost effective. And that's where people talk about the $50,000 per quality uh, threshold. Below that threshold, things are called, considered cost effective. Um, others, um, including David, have written about how the, if the, the, the real cost effectiveness threshold that we use in the United States is probably closer to $250,000 or $300,000 per quality based on the way we spend money already. In this quadrant, the, the Northwest, um, costs go up and health outcomes get worse. So in this, in this quadrant, if something lands there, it's what we call dominated. It's really not something we would ever do. In the Southwest quadrant, these are interventions that lower costs but make health worse. Um, there have been some really interesting articles about how maybe we should be thinking about interventions that do this. Not, you know, not very harmful, but just a little bit harmful. But if we can save money, maybe it's worth considering these uh, Southwest Quadrant uh, interventions. And in the south, uh, Southeast Quadrant is kind of the, 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 you know, kind of the nirvana of cost effectiveness analysis. These are interventions that save money and improve health. And we would love for everything to land here. Um, I'll show you some examples of, of cases where we have found examples of things that have actually landed in the southeast quadrant. But that's how to interpret the cost effectiveness ratio. So, um, so, the, 
So I talked about the rules of the road, which are set out by uh, people like David. And the tools of the trade are really, in, in, and certainly in diabetes economic evaluation, are these, uh, what I'm showing you is a cartoon model of a simulation model of diabetes complications. And this, is, this one comes from uh, Nita Lytiripong's recent paper in Annal Internal Medicine. It's actually based on the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study, uh, OM2, uh, Outcomes Model 2. And these, are mo these models typically um, follow the life of an individual they're at risk for developing different complications uh, during their life. Um, they follow each individual every year. If they survive that, they also, we also account for the likelihood of death. If they survive a given year, we uh, go on to the next year, and we model their entire life with these simulation models. And these models are built on typically cohort data uh, for long-term follow-up studies of people with diabetes, where we know from epidemiology the rates of complications, and we know the major predictors of those complications. And we assume that uh, if we modify those predictors, and this is a big assumption, if we modify those, those uh, predictors, that we change the course of disease. So um, I'm just going to march through. Um, it's a little bit of a history of the major trials of, of diabetes, major innovations in diabetes. But I'm going to talk about um, prevention. Uh, the value of intensive diabetes care, like basically treating people intensively with lower glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol. I'm going to talk about uh, the value of uh, designing an intervention to just implement and deliver uh, diabetes care better in a healthcare system. Actually, we're trying, uh, we're trying to do this right now in our own health system. Um, and I'm going to veer a little bit towards um, some, some more specialized forms of diabetes. I'll talk about devices in the context of type 1 diabetes, where we actually are in, the, in an era where we have actually, the, uh, actually now the artificial pancreas. And then I'll talk about uh, personalized medicine, how we've done studies about. And this is actually where we've really been a very a different kind of uh, health economic group, where we've evaluated innovative ideas like personalization, uh, both in terms of setting goals for diabetes care treatments, but also in terms of targeting treatments to the, uh, the, the genetic profile of an individual. So. Um, uh, but so, so, believe it or not, many of the, in, the innovations I'm going to talk about, they have all occurred since I was a resident, in, uh, since I, I finished residency. Um, so it's only been in the last uh, uh, 17 to 18 years that we've had actually the, the evidence uh, available to study, uh, to, to, to prevent diabetes and also treat it. But prior to that, we were flying by the seat of our pants. So in terms of diabetes prevention, this is a large-scale multi-center randomized controlled trial that was published in the early 2000s, around 2000, uh, yeah, 2002. This is, uh, the University of Chicago played a key role in actually enrolling most of the African Americans in this trial came from uh, University of Chicago. And actually, if you go to the um, M200, M corridor on the second floor, you'll still see some of the DPP uh, patients there in, in, in the outcome study that's still ongoing um, uh, here. In any case, the, ran, this is a major randomized controlled trial that enrolled people with pre-diabetes. So they didn't have diabetes, but they, they had a, a little elevation in their blood sugar. They were randomized to a lifestyle intervention, which included um, an effort to reduce weight by 7%, 150 minutes a week of exercise, just brisk walking, and a better diet. They got a lot of, they got free gym shoes and a lot of other things along the way, a lot of encouragement to do their lifestyle change. Another arm received metformin, which is actually a early, uh, early stage treatment for type 2 diabetes as it is, but at a lower dose. And, uh, they, and then a, a third group was the placebo arm that got nothing. Um, and during the course of the trial, the individuals who received the lifestyle intervention had a 50% reduction in their risk of developing diabetes. So this is a, um, I think this is, this is what your mother would have told you to do, but in a randomized controlled trial. The metformin arm didn't do as well, but did reduce the incidence of diabetes. And the placebo arm, of course, did the worst. So this has actually served as the evidence base for all the subsequent work in translating diabetes prevention into the community. And has also served, um, actually is, is now um, 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 actually a covered service um, in Medicare. So, um, uh, and actually that's a more complicated story, but uh, Medicare actually now covers uh, diabetes prevention, the diabetes prevention program. 
And so what um, Health Economics Group, for, I think is a combination of the CDC investigators and Bill Herman from University of Michigan, they attached the, the end of the, the, the findings of the DPP to a simulation model of diabetes and its complications. And uh, here they forecast out um, the rates of di incident diabetes for the different arms, for the placebo arm. They, have, they go on to develop more incident diabetes than, uh, than the metformin arm and the lifestyle arm. So they're essentially just extending the finding, assum assuming everything holds true from the end of the trial going forward, this is what would happen to the rates of diabetes. And then they account for the complications and costs of having diabetes um, uh, decades later. And because of lower rates of, of, in, of diabetes, lower rates of complications, uh, individuals in the lifestyle intervention arm had the lowest co lifetime costs um, uh, compared to, um, uh, these are the intervention costs, but overall costs uh, are lower in the intervention arm uh, versus placebo. Um, uh, so there's a little increase in costs with implementation of the of the lifestyle intervention because it's a mixed, you have actually the cost of the intervention, but you have cost savings from lower rates of complications. They have better quality of life uh, in the lifestyle intervention uh, in a higher uh, at 0.57 over a lifetime. Metformin also increased quality of life, but not as much. And the overall difference in costs over uh, difference in qualities for lifestyle is $8,800 per quality. So it's in the northeast quadrant, uh, very cost effective by most conventional thresholds, as is the, the metformin arm at $29,900 per quality. Um, and um, so this actually is, uh, so these are both interventions that we would consider cost effective. They're not cost saving. Does anybody know the follow-up of what really happened with the, the, the subsequent follow-up of the patients? Can you guess what happened with the lifestyle intervention people? Rita? So eventually they gained weight? Yes. So they had a difficult time maintaining the lifestyle intervention and um, they actually stopped, st stopped adhering to the therapy. And the metformin arm? They actually ended up doing, they actually, uh, actually in follow up, they actually do pretty good. So it's kind of sad, nobody wants to hear this, but taking a pill a day was actually easier to adhere to. And long term, this, act, this result actually might be flipped. Uh, this model, is, this, is, this assumed that everything would hold, would hold stable over time, but actually things likely flipped. David. What happened to life expectancy? So if you don't quality I think life expectancy goes up a little bit. Yeah. I'd have to look up the paper, but I don't remember exactly. Yeah. I, David, I'm pretty sure they didn't do future costs. I'm pretty sure they didn't account for future costs. I'm pretty sure they did not account for future costs. They broke your rule. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Diabetes is something very objective, based on sugar or chemical thing. Why should placebo be effective? Is this because a lot of times you do placebo, but you do other things? And uh, maybe at the same time, the person you give placebo is also conscious of a lifestyle and all of a sudden. Sure. Sure. Of diabetes, yeah. so he also that. So we add him, are this because valuable because uh, you give too much credit to placebo. I see. Yeah, that's a good point. The placebo arm individuals, they definitely had a freedom to do whatever they wanted in terms of their life, lifestyle. So you're right, this is uh, not really a comparison against nothing, because the placebo arm is actually doing something. Um, and actually at the end of the trial, if you think about it, they, they, they likely, they learned about the results and could actually take out, could adopt the, uh, the, the, li the lifestyle intervention that was done in the trial. Um, but in terms of the actual execution of trial, they literally received a placebo versus metformin. So they literally, so they literally had a, a, a sugar pill that they took every day. Um, but that's a good point. But it's, it's very complicated. And uh, just as another side note, um, the, 
So this would, ex this would show you, th you know, the result of these analyses suggest that there is actually no true cost savings for the system with diabetes prevention. You, uh, and that doesn't really fit what public health people would want to hear. They want to hear that something saves money. Um, so what happened was this study was uh, uh, basically repeated in some form in, uh, un uh, under the auspices of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It was one of an, in, it was an innovation award um, in a Medicare population. And within a two to three year period in a Medicare population, that program managed to somehow save money. And with the innovation uh, program, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has the ability to implement anything that saves money across the entire system. And that's why Medicare now covers diabetes prevention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, 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 that. But this is, it's this fascinating example of the politics of prevention. Mm -hmm. Everything is ugly and deceptive at times as the Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's a great, I, thank you for that insight because it didn't, it, 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 even the even the original actuarial result doesn't anyway doesn't quite make does certainly doesn't make sense in terms of our understanding of how diabetes works. So if you, it was saving money, where was where were they saving money, and how how was it happening? Um, the other uh, kind of um, unfortunate sad story about diabetes prevention as well is that um, it's actually even when it's a covered service. So you may have heard about United Healthcare covering diabetes prevention, and now Medicare covers diabetes prevention. Well, it turns out that once United Healthcare adopted diabetes prevention, there has actually been almost no uptake of, even though it's a covered service, it's almost, it's actually not even, it's rarely used by anybody. <laughs> um, and in terms of the Medicare um, uh, covered service, um, if, if you've actually looked to see where you can send somebody to get uh, diabetes prevention services, there are actually almost no service providers in Chicago um, because it's very hard to make money uh, delivering diabetes prevention. There's actually been a lot of, um, a lot of requirements tied to, uh, tied to getting payment. Um, you have to basically get the patient to lose weight before you get paid. and So it's very difficult. Uh, so it's an incomplete story, but um, uh, very interesting. You know, I think preventing diabetes, almost no one would argue with it, but there's a lot of complicated details uh, in, in implementation. Yes? Well, it has to do with the fact that any kind of form of prevention, and I'll show this later in genetic testing is actually an even better example, but you have to basically assume that you're implementing something across a population of people. And among, so the costs of a program are borne by everyone who's exposed to the program. But the actual event rates uh, are only experienced by a minority of that overall population. So that it's the difference between, uh, it has to do with the cost of the program and implementing it, how many people get touched in the denominator, and then the numerator of people who actually benefit is smaller than you think. Um, so that, that's actually that, that the general problem with prevention. Okay, so in the same year that the diabetes uh, prevention program publishes results, um, uh, yes? <laughs> Yes. It was 26 light years for gained for lifestyle intervention and 0.2 for metformin. And so actually metformin had side effects that took away um, half the benefit, whereas for lifestyle yeah. it, it didn't. So lifestyle is not only sort of a bigger benefit and 
more cost effective, but when you appropriately account for the life expectancy, it, it, it does really well. It actually does really well. Now there is the the sort of the Weinstein old story about how you account for the utility associated with lifestyle modifications. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Like run it with like jogging this thing. Right. Like <laughs> well, the, the 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 I mean the 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 uptake the um, the la lack of enthusiasm for the uptake of diabetes prevention actually I think hints at some disutility associated with with lifestyle intervention. Um, so at the same time ZPP came out uh, in, in the early 19 in the late 1990s around 98 the first trials of um, uh, of diabe intensive diabetes care were published this is a combination of the United Kingdom prospective diabetes study which provided the evidence for preventing uh, for blood pressure lowering and glucose lowering but also statin trials were coming out in the late 1990s so in 2002 the um, uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, cost effectiveness group published this uh, actually fairly uh, I would call in, in the field of cost effectiveness analysis and diabetes a landmark study in JAMA describing the cost effectiveness of each of these components of routine diabetes care, lowering sugars, lowering blood pressure, and lowering cholesterol with a statin. Um, and um, I think I may have just gone straight to the um, uh, bottom line here, uh, which is, so they did uh, the same thing that the DPP folks did. They, they attached the trial results for these three different therapies to a forecasting model of diabetes that they had built. And um, for intensive glucose control, they found that the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was around 41,000. It um, improved quality adjusted life years by, a, uh, by about 0.19. Um, Total costs um, uh, were increased a bit. Uh, similarly, for hypertension, for cholesterol as well, the ICER is around 52,000. Um, again, it improves quality adjusted life years by 0.3475, but at, uh, at increased costs. The one um, in intervention among diabetes, among these three therapies that had the, a very different result is hypertension. And actually, if you know the history of the UK PDS, it produced both cardiovascular uh, uh, benefits, but also microvascular benefits. So in the case of hypertension, it's actually a cost-saving intervention. In not only uh, improve, incre increases quality of life years by 0.3962, but also reduces overall costs because the, the rates of the number of complications prevented is so numerous. So, um, and uh, an interesting sub finding of the uh, of the study is that, of course, there's an age effect. So, the age at which you have the you receive the intervention uh, alters the cost effectiveness uh, of of the therapy. So, uh, in particular, for intensive glucose control, you'll see that for a young person in their 20s, uh, intensive glucose control has an ICER of 9,600. But if you're an 80 year old, uh, the cost effectiveness ratio is around 2.1 million. So, uh, uh, there's a there's basically an issue of, 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 of um, life expectancy, how much time you have to benefit from a therapy that affects the, affects the economic value of interventions. So, um, so that's great. Um, and so around the same time, the UKPDS came out, and at the same time, the, the JAMA papers came out around the cost effectiveness of, of diabetes care. Um, there were a lot of efforts underway to try to disseminate throughout the country best practices with diabetes care. How do we get more people to achieve A1Cs of seven, blood pressures below a certain threshold, and how do we get more people on statins? And um, one of the efforts was something called the Health Disparities Collaborative, which was a national quality improvement effort in federally qualified health centers to try to improve the quality of diabetes care. And it included uh, at least three major components in the intervention, included um, uh, continuous quality improvement, included uh, uh, basically uh, teaching around the chronic care model, which is means, uh, which I'll show you in some more detail from Ed Wagner, and then there were active learning sessions for, uh, for health centers. So health centers did a lot to um, form uh, quality improvement teams. And actually, Marshall Chin was involved with the, this national evaluation of the Health Disparities Collaborative. These are the, this is the typical plan, do, study, act. You basically um, develop a plan to improve, improve diabetes care. You try it for a while, and you move on to the, uh, to the you, 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 you see whether or not you've made any improvements, and you iterate on the intervention itself. And um, another, one point to make about the Health Disparities Collaborative, it, it took place in an era without electronic medical records. So if you wanted to 
didn't know if A1Cs were better, blood pressure was better, or if there was more statin use. You had to actually pull charts to basically abstract that data. So, uh, so when I refer to the cost of this particular program, um, there's actually more human costs associated with quality improvement in this era um, than, than we have, I think, today. And this is the, uh, the classic um, uh, model of the chronic care model uh, developed by Ed Wagner uh, from Group Health Cooperative. But you basically have health systems within communities, um, and then you, um, uh, you have the healthcare organization, you have um, uh, the activated patient interacting with uh, prepared proactive practice teams, producing uh, productive interactions, and then that leads to the uh, functional clinical outcomes that we have for our patients. So, um, uh, there's just more details about the Health Disparities Collaborative. Um, it, it, there was actually a, 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 a special uh, randomized controlled trial that, uh, that um, Marshall led, which included things more teaching around shared decision making. Um, um, but you get the point. This was, a, this was a collaborative effort where they actually learned from each other uh, using, um, uh, they actually had a listserv, they had regular calls with each other, uh, leaders of the quality improvement teams across health centers throughout the country. So um, this was not conducted as a randomized controlled trial. So we have, uh, but, but this is what we know from um, the chart abstraction done over time, which is that in, in terms of processes of care, it appeared that diabetes care did improve in these health centers from 1998 to 2002. People who had an A1C measured increased from 71% to 92%. Lipid assessment also increased. There was more prescribing of aspirin during this time. There was more prescribing of ACE inhibitors during this time, going from 33% to 50% of patients. And um, actual laboratory outcomes and other biomeasures also improved during the same time. A1Cs decreased from eight, an average of 8.6% to 7.9%. LDL cholesterol also declined, most likely due to higher rates of statin prescribing. And the blood pressure remained roughly the same during this time period, even though there was greater use of ACE inhibitors. So we, uh, uh, um, as part of this, incorporated these results into um, the simulation model of diabetes that we had at that time, uh, a, a type 2 diabetes model, and simulated, um, basically, if, if we were to compare uh, the biomeasures and the therapies prescribed in 1998, to the biomeasures and therapies prescribed in 2002, what is the, you know, what's the, uh, what's the incremental gain and what's the incremental cost uh, of changing diabetes care in that way? And what we found is that if, 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 if uh, if you believe that those, uh, those trends would remain separate over time, there would be reductions in uh, blindness, renal failure, um, lower rates of heart disease, and improvements in quality adjusted life years with the changes in diabetes care. Overall, uh, with, with, with more costs, of course, uh, and this included both programmatic costs, but also the cost of increased use of therapies. And we had a, with this combined implementation of diabetes care, we had an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of 33,000 uh, per quality. So a reasonable, this program, if it were um, uh, to remain in place, would be uh, as good as a, a, new, a new drug. So overall, what I've shown you in the last uh, a series of talks, a uh, series of papers, is that um, diabetes prevention, either through lifestyle or metformin, is very cost effective. In terms of diabetes treatments, uh, hypertension management is actually cost saving. The other two, glucose control and cholesterol control, are cost effective, but uh, probably not cost effective among the very old. And in terms of implementing diabetes care in a health system, it's also very cost effective. So uh, sort of a shift um, uh, around, uh, uh, it, it, there's basically a separate uh, sort of uh, trajectory of innovations going on in the field of type 1 diabetes. And in, around 2005 or 6, uh, we were approached to be the health economics team for a major randomized controlled trial uh, of, of, uh, of glucose, uh, continuous glucose monitors. Continuous glucose monitors at the time in 2006 looked like this. this is, Actually, this company is still in existence, Dexcom. They're still the leading manufacturer of, of continuous glucose monitors. But these monitors have a little a straw that goes basically under the skin and detects subcutaneous glucose levels continuously. And you can see in this, in this uh, little uh, picture 
uh, what the person is doing is they're seeing their continuous glu- their, their, their sugar levels in their subcutaneous fat continuously over time. And this uh, device, along with the detection uh, measurement of sugars, had, has associated alarms, um, can, can tell you when your sugars are too high or too low, um, and also allowed you to anticipate, um, prepare for meals, to anticipate how much you'd have to um, uh, adjust. Uh, your insulin dose uh, with these measures. So it really was an incredible advance to have continuous glucose monitors. Um, And the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation organized a multi-center trial of these devices. This was one of several devices. The other device was um, the Avid Navigator, which uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, This was the probe that would be inserted into the skin and taped to your skin. And this is the uh, little pager you would carry to kind of see your numbers. and, um, and the, the actual randomized control trial was published in the New England Journal. What they found was that people who were randomized to the CGM basically had fairly dramatic, this is actually the, uh, this is a 26 week trial, and these are the glycated hemoglobin levels, the A1C levels, at week 26, at the end of the trial. And these are the three different subgroups. These are adults over 25. These are uh, uh, adolescents 15 to 20, and young adults 15 to 24. And these are young uh, children 8 to 14. So they had a whole range of people, uh, uh, the, the whole age spectrum. And you can see for the adults, there's actually a shift in the A1C distribution at the end of the trial um, with the use of CGM. Whereas you don't see much of a shift at all for the uh, adolescents and young adults and for the children. And do you know what correlated with uh, these differences in the subgroups? Um, Well, it relates to what we talked about earlier with the lifestyle. It's basically simple adherence. So can you guess which group wore the devices more? So this is basically completely tracks with wear time. So the adults were more willing to wear the device regularly. The adolescents, uh, according to uh, any pediatricians in the audience, so apparently they're quite difficult. When, and um, uh, oh yeah, I actually have one of those. Um, and they don't, you know, they don't listen to you. They don't wear the device. And then for the little, for the children, even though you would think that they had um, the oversight of the of their parents, there's actually a, there was actually at that time a technical problem, which was the children didn't have enough uh, skin landscape in order to put the um, to glue the uh, the probe on. Um, uh, but in any case, um, if, you can, if you use the device routinely, you can improve your sugars. And um, we, also, we, we did this um, additional, um, <laughs> this will never be repeated again, but what we did was we actually made people in the trial do time trade-off questions about their current experience um, at 0, 13, and 26 weeks. The reason I, I'm saying we're likely not to repeat this again, it was very arduous. Um, we actually caused some emotional distress among some of the trial participants when they answered questions about trading time off. Um, but it was invaluable in many ways because we were actually able to detect a utility change separate from the glucose improvements. Um, and you can start to see that patients uh, were adults with high A1Cs above seven. They had higher utility ratings uh, at 13 and 26 weeks than those who are randomized to uh, standard glucose monitoring. Yes? I don't what, what you oh, they're insane questions. So imagine you have, uh, in your current state of health, let's say uh, you have a choice between 10 years in your current state of health or 10 years with diabetes. Which would you choose? That's a standard opening question that you, will, you, you should answer. I would choose life without diabetes for 10 years. Then we alter the math. And we say, what would you do if you had a choice between 10 years with diabetes but five years in perfect health? Which would you choose? And we go back and forth. And we find a point at which we, the person says it's no different. And in these individuals, look at the ratings they gave from the, the, rating, the utility ratings from zero to one. They, the ratings are very high. These people did not want to trade off life. They actually, their quality of life was actually quite high by multiple measures. It's actually indicated here as well. But there is a difference between those who were using the CGM versus those who were not. Um, 
And actually, the difference in quality of life is even greater among those with good glucose control, A1Cs below 7. And this is likely due to the fact that the CGM helped them prevent hypoglycemia, uh, alleviated fear of hypoglycemia. And so you can see there, here they also have higher utility ratings during this time, during this time frame. Very difficult to execute. We somehow persuaded the trial investigators to do this. I think I remember Marshall, uh, I remember David and I going down to Florida to persuade them to do this. They relented. It's actually, it was the first data collection of time trade-off utilities in, in type 1 diabetes that, it was, that had been ever been done. So we, and the other thing that happened was, uh, so, uh, so we, both, we combined the utility improvements in, in quality, the improvements in quality of life with the improvements in sugar, and again, attached the trial results to a forecasting model of type 1 diabetes. And again, with CGM, there would be improvements and reductions in rates of complications um, uh, across the board because of improvements in glucose control. And um, life expectancy would also be, would overall be higher with CGM versus control. In terms of quality adjusted life years, there would be a, di a fairly sizable difference of 0.6 years for those with uh, A1Cs above 7, but for, for those with low A1Cs below 7, there'd be even a higher quality adjusted life improvement. And um, here is the uh, overall point estimate for the ICER for both therapies. So landing in the northeast quadrant, uh, you'll notice that there's actually quite a bit of uncertainty around, uh, uh, there's actually a big cloud of uncertainty around these results. Um, but these point estimates were then later used to make coverage decisions um, uh, across the world. And so CGM is now, uh, is not totally easy to obtain, but it is, a, is generally a covered service for type 1 diabetes. So, Fast forward 10 years later, these devices, you'll remember the old clunky uh, Dexcom. This is the Dexcom, um, like I think, uh, yeah, Dexcom 5, G5. It's uh, the, uh, you know, it's the next, you know, it's sort of like, they, they try to copy um, the iPhone, you know, iPhone 7, 8, 10. Um, so Dexcom G5 looks like this. It um, also has a little probe that goes underneath the skin with a little straw, detects subcutaneous fat, but the detector is now in your phone. So you can have an app in your phone, to, that, that's where the software is for, detecting, to, for um, tracking your sugars, or you can wear it as a watch, or you can have it as a freestanding device like a pager, like before. So this is the kind of the modernization of the continuous glucose monitor. And um, the Diamond trial was done um, very similarly to the JDRF trial. In the Diamond trial, they randomized individuals with type 1 diabetes who were using uh, multiple daily injections. The JDRF trial was done in people, many of whom were using insulin pumps already. So most of the people in the Diamond trial were uh, receiving multiple injections per day. And basically the same thing happened in the Diamond trial as in the JDRF trial, which was that there's a shift in the 24-week uh, hemoglobin A1C distribution uh, shifting downward for those using the continuous glucose monitor. And again, we looked at uh, we looked at the within trial analysis. In this case, we were not brave enough to do time trade-off. We used uh, more indirect methods for eliciting utilities. We did not find any change in utility. Uh, I think we used EQ5D. Is that right? When, um, and we did find, of course, that the costs of using the device increased costs overall for these patients. Um, it's about I think for annually it costs about five thousand dollars per year to use a continuous glucose monitor. And again, we attached the trial results to a simulation model of type 1 diabetes, now using a more updated version of the model from Sheffield, England. And in the, in, in the end, with improvements in sugar and also improvements in uh, prevention of hypoglycemia, there's an overall improvement in quality of, in, in um, life years as well as quality adjusted life years and a difference in costs with an ICER around 98,000 per quality adjusted life year. So very similar to the ICER that we produced um, from the JDRF trial. Um, one thing of note is that um, many people with these devices do things to prolong, the device requires replacement of parts routinely. And if you, when we did the modeling, we assumed that the patient would follow the rules and replace uh, the sensor, for example, every week. But in real life, what people do is they cheat and they prolong the use of the device as long as possible, sometimes extending the, extending the life of replacement parts two weeks, three weeks. And if you account for that um, adjustment of real world use, the actual cost effectiveness ratio actually comes down to as low as uh, 33,000 or 42,000 per quality just a life year, making the intervention even more cost effective.
Um, one thing I did not, I, I'm not showing you is that there was actually a second trial attached uh, to this first trial that was actually much, I, I didn't have time to assemble it, but actually has even more interesting results. The people that were randomized to CGM were randomized further to an insulin pump or not. And the addition of insulin pump actually worsened quality of life. Which gets at this idea that um, the, it's possible that the sequencing of these devices may affect their value to individuals or their quality of life, but also that um, uh, what the CGM manufacturers believe is that the CGM is really the, is the driver of the better outcomes. It's not the pump. But um, I'm happy to, and that's a separate publication that we have um, that I'm happy to share with you. So in terms of these devices and this whole world of the artificial pancreas, which I've not even fully uh, talked about, uh, the CGM is cost effective in, in adults with type 1 diabetes and using pumps, adults with type 1 diabetes using multiple daily injections. And in, with real world use, the CGM becomes very highly cost effective because of longer term use of supplies and lower replacement costs. Um, we faced a lot of challenges in doing these studies and measuring increasingly things that patients don't even know about. So one of the challenges in the more recent Diamond trial is that there are, uh, people are experiencing hypoglycemia that they don't ex feel. So how do you assign a quality of life value to that? How do you monetize that? They're not waking up, they're, they're not feeling it, but we know that it's probably not good for them. So that's a one methodologic challenge that we have faced. Um, and you know, really where this field is going is that there's, because we now have uh, full on devices that are a combination of pumps and, and sensors, uh, it's really the entire artificial pancreas that's going to become the next, you know, should we pay for that routinely? So I'm going to shift gears towards uh, studies of more kind of personalization or individualization. And this is a recent study that, um, you, if you uh, attended Grand Rounds recently, Nita like Chirapong described, it's published in Annals of Internal Medicine. And uh, what she, uh, and this is the team of investigators, including Rochelle Naylor from Endocrinology, Philip Clark from Oxford, Reza, who's, Reza Skandari, who's now at Imperial College, uh, Jen Cooper, a project manager, and Aaron Wynn, who's now at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And what, uh, what uh, Nita wanted to study was, in the 2002 study I showed you from the CDC, they just assumed that everyone in the world would just adopt intensive glucose control. But we know that this is not likely to be good for everybody, that there likely needs to be some individualization of the glycemic target based on how sick people are, how old they are, what other conditions they have, where they are in the stage of disease. And this is a graphic that comes from the American Diabetes Association showing what they proposed are different uh, clinical criteria for titrating up the uh, sugar target from more stringent to less stringent. And what Nita did was she, she basically operationalized the entire uh, uh, protocol for individualization and shifted people's targets over their life course uh, as they lived with diabetes over time and then used the UKPDS model to model its long-term effects. Also accounted for medication side effects, including hypoglycemia. And um, uh, the model that we use, again, is this U United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study model. This model doesn't account for things like the legacy effect that we know, now know exists in, in, um, in diabetes. Nevertheless, what, you, what happens with individualization is that more people are allowed to have higher sugars. And so what Nita did was she let basically the people in the individualization protocol had higher rates of complications because they have higher sugars. So this could be in the southwest quadrant. Maybe we're letting people have more complications. So they have higher rates of myocardial infarction, stroke, blindness, and so on. Um, at the same time, the individuals had better quality of life, um, even though they had higher rates of complications. And that's because in the model, she also accounted for hypoglycemia, which affects quality of life from day to day. Uh, and, and, and people in the individualization strategy had lower rates of, hypo, of, of hypoglycemia. So you have slightly higher rates of complications, but less hypoglycemia. Um, and overall, um, she compared the costs of implementing a uniform uh, lowering of sugars, as like, the, like what we did in, in the CDC study, compared to individualization. And basically, overall costs of care, of, of delivering individualized care, is actually lower than it is for the uh, uh, basically making everyone, mandating everyone to achieve an A1C below 7. And a lot of it's due to lower use of medication. So um, uh, that's where the cost savings arise. 
And with that, um, uh, again, this balance between quality of life and longer life, life expectancy is, was found to be a little bit lower with individualization, uh, but quality of life was actually improved. Uh, due to these changes in, 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 in uh, avoidance of medications and avoidance of hypoglycemia. Overall, the quality of life improves if you account for all these things at the same time. So individualization of glyce glycemic control in the United States might save money. It's, it might save up to $234 billion. It would reduce life expectancy. So maybe it's in the southwest quadrant, but quality of life is better. So it's a difficult uh, trade-off. Um, but it, uh, I think this paper also highlights the fact that, uh, what, and actually in other studies we've shown, is that um, people's preferences for different states, uh, the, the, these analyses are very sensitive to your assumptions about people's preferences. So in the end, for the individual patient, we have to account for what they think is important and what's valuable to them. Maybe it's okay for them to remain on medications even though they're in, the, you know, even they're in their 80s. So another variation on individualization is this uh, study that is, is pretty unique to the University of Chicago. I don't think it would have happened anywhere else. Because what we did was uh, basically partner with um, uh, Graham Bell. Um, uh, and this is a picture of Graham Bell and uh, Ken Polanski. And this is a picture of Stephen Fyans. These are uh, scientists that discovered monogenic diabetes. So these are inves investigators in the 80s and 90s who discovered the uh, these rare forms of diabetes that are due to a specific genetic defect. And uh, this is a family tree of a real individual um, with a pedigree of an individual who has um, a monogenic diabetes um, with a defect in H uh, genetic defect entitled HNF4-alpha. And I think this is the picture of the family. Family. Um, and so uh, what happened was I think I literally ran to Graham Bell in the hallway and uh, started talking to him about um, cost effectiveness studies. And we came up with this, hatch this idea of, of studying the economics of genetic screening. And that began a series of papers that we've done in neonatal diabetes, in, um, in monogenic diabetes. And I'm going to feature a study that was recently led uh, by a medical student, actually only a second year medical student, Matthew Goodsmith, uh, um, backed up by Rochelle Naylor in pediatric endocrinology. Um, this is just a graphic showing all the different genetic forms of diabetes that we now know of and, and what parts of the, uh, of the system they affect. This is the, a picture of the beta cell. Some of these genetic defects um, can actually, the genetic defect can dictate what therapy is best for the individual. So this is a picture for individuals with this particular form of monogenic diabetes, HNF1-alpha, in which they have a de defect where their potassium channels on the surface of their beta cells remain fixed and open. And it turns out that uh, the treatment for this uh, channel is actually an old-fashioned old diabetes drug called sulfonylureas. If the person takes high doses of sulfonylureas, this potassium ATPase channel closes, thus uh, starting membrane depolarization, opening up of calcium channels, and then release of insulin. So the beta cell becomes revived with the use of sulfonylureas. So if you know that the person has this genetic defect, you can target the treatment to them correctly without knowing this information. You may be noticing that they have higher sugars and treating them blindly without knowing about their specific form of diabetes. So um, what Matthew did was he um, uh, developed a basically a giant simulation model of diabetes that accounts for four or five different forms of diabetes. Uh, one form being HNF1-alpha, one is the GCK modi, in addition to models of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And uh, this is a, uh, and, and what he did was say, let's assume that we can assess the whole uh, population of children with diabetes in America. And let's say we can institute uniform uh, biomarker testing and genetic testing in this population and target and change their therapies according to what form of diabetes they have compared to what we have today, which is we're blindly treating children without knowing this information. Um, and in the case of HNO1-alpha, um, I, as I told you earlier, we assumed that they would take on sulfonylurea treatment, which actually not only um, um, uh, it actually improves their glycemic control, but also lets them avoid therapy like insulin. For GCK Modi, uh, these are individuals who actually don't develop complications from diabetes, so they don't need treatment at all. So it, without the genetic testing, they would be treated. 
So we did this additional step, uh, which was to add on cascade testing. So if you know if an individual has uh, Modi, you can actually then go on and check individuals in their family to see if they have that genetic, that genetic form of diabetes. And that therefore extend the benefits of genetic testing beyond the original person who was tested. And so this is just a picture of the complex model that Matthew built uh, that um, tracks, uh, these are individuals in the control arm where we don't know anything about their genetic status and we, and we know how they're treated currently based on um, observational studies of pediatric populations. And then on the upper part of the graphic, we have in the institution of the screening, the biomarker testing, and then the genetic testing that follows. And we have the targeted treatment of all the, these individuals to the right to, to match the therapy to their genetic form of diabetes. And um, what Matthew found is that if you institute this biomarker and genetic testing um, strategy, you actually save money for the system a little bit per person, only a relatively small, about $191, but you don't increase costs. You basically, you lower costs a little bit, and you improve quality of life a little bit overall for the whole population. So for this rare condition, which is around 1 or 2% of the population, if you institute this, this program, you may care better, but things are about neutral or slightly better. If you add cascade testing, the cost savings are even more accentuated, and the benefits are actually also accentuated. So these are examples of, the, of a, a strategy that lands in the southeast quadrant of the cost-effectiveness plane. And the, the challenge is that the majority of people don't benefit from the testing. Only a small minority of people benefit from the testing. And this just demonstrates how, how much these individuals with monogenic diabetes have a better life with uh, the appropriate therapy. In the case of HNF1 alpha, uh, these individuals have life extension of half a year, quality of life extension of about half a year, and they save about 100,000 over the course of their lifespan. Individuals with GCK Modi also save a lot of money and have uh, smaller improvements in quality of life. Um, and these are just the results of the sensitivity analysis um, showing that if we add cascade testing it, uh, this is actually expressed in terms of net monetary benefit. We, the more to the right the, uh, the, the point is, the, the greater the net monetary benefit is. So if you add cascade testing, you accentuate net monetary benefit. So um, the key issue with genetic testing and economics is that uh, we have to reduce the number of people who undergo the testing. And so the biomarker screening uh, allowed us to, to narrow the number of people who would get the genetic testing. And then combining that with, um, um, uh, uh, combining that with cascade testing makes this a really uh, um, a valuable um, intervention. And um, at this point, it's actually very difficult to get genetic testing. It's not routinely covered by insurance. Um, but um, I, I believe that these, these kind of analyses could change that. And this paper is really powerful because it shows uh, the potential population health benefits of personalized medicine. So um, you know, most innovations in diabetes prevention and care, uh, they improve health, but usually at a greater cost. Um, and the, um, these innovations, um, you know, what I've done is I showed you a whole series of cost effectiveness analyses, but that doesn't really solve the budgetary problem we have, which is that you could have a, we have every year an increasing number of cost effective therapies that insurance can cover. But just because something's cost effective doesn't help solve the budgetary limits that payers face. So the more things that we find to be valuable, the more it compounds the problem of the budget. Um, and, um, but I've tried to show you in a couple examples, there are some innovations where we can actually save money or keep um, costs relatively neutral by making and make health better. And that's in the form of personalization related to personalizing diabetes care by disease history, comorbid con conditions, and in the future, I think, with the genetic profiles of individuals. Um, and then I didn't even talk about how things like having access to care at the right time in your life, like through the Affordable Care Act, can also change, can actually be something we can also monetize in terms of economic value. And all of this actually um, is, uh, you know, has to be viewed also in terms of the broader policy uh, land landscape that is happening at the same time. Um, and I just want to feature a few things that are happening. Because we live in a country where we don't actually use cost effectiveness results to make decisions, at least not overtly. We're actually, in some cases, banned from using cost effectiveness analysis. Um, but um, 
Uh, I'll show you some examples of where it's being snuck in. But I, I don't know if, is anyone, everyone aware that um, there's, there's a change in, in the House of Representatives since January? It's really quite different. Um, so the House uh, Committee on Commerce and Energy sent this really awesome letter to the three major manufacturers of insulin, uh, I think over this weekend. And this letter is awesome. Um, it basically um, says to them, why, how do you justify the increase in price of insulin? And they have this particular quote um, that actually is related to the JAMA. It, it actually cite, it, it cites the finding from our JAMA letter that I showed you at the beginning. Despite that, the fact that it has been available for decades, prices for insulin have skyrocketed in recent years, putting it out of reach for many patients. For instance, insulin's price nearly tripled between 2002 and 2013, then nearly doubled between 2012 and 16. Medicare Part D spending has also risen, as has out-of-patient cost spending. Diabetes patients who do not have insurance are particularly vulnerable to price increases. So what this is an example is, of is um, basically there's increasing oversight from government, from Medicaid programs, from, from um, these congressional committees uh, that is, they're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use the force of the bully pulpit to change uh, the discussion around uh, drug prices. Um, the Trump administration is also trying to change uh, through a lot of action to try to change, try to, uh, um, they're targeting in particular uh, the pharmacy benefit managers and trying to reveal all the rebates they, they, that they seem to benefit from. They're interested in that, that part of the system, but they're, the manufacturers also are, I think, playing a role in, in increasing prices, and, and Congress is targeting the manufacturers. Um, in the last year, I was named to something called the Midwest Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council, which is part of something called Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. I mentioned that the United States doesn't use cost effectiveness analysis in informal decisions around coverage decisions. But this was an organization started about 10 years ago that actually is trying to serve as a, as a, in a pseudo governmental role to actually formally act like um, the United Kingdom's NICE. So on this panel, we review the cost-effectiveness analysis results of different new therapies. The day um, uh, of these meetings is really quite wild. The morning session starts with a presentation of the analysis, just like I showed you. It is followed by two hours of, of, of uh, basically direct commentary from the public, from individuals who frequently have the disease or parents of individuals who have the disease. And they are uh, not always happy that someone is asking about the economic value of the therapy that they are benefiting from. Yes? is done in the nicest way possible. It starts with a careful di discussion around the benefits of a therapy. And it's only later that we talk about the cost effectiveness analysis. But they do have a cost effectiveness threshold. They use 150,000 per quality. And the panel has to vote in public on whether or not they believe the therapy is cost effective or not. Yeah. Who decides what I don't entirely know how the therapies arrive at ICER's attention, but um, uh, I, I, I think it's possibly ICER itself uh, identifying novel therapies that are very expensive. Um, but I think the insurance, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some role of the insurance plans um, actually uh, sh sh shunting ideas to ICER. But the um, afternoon meeting is attended by not only payers, but the manufacturers of the drugs. So far, the therapies that I have seen, one cost $1 million per quality. The other was, uh, had an annual cost of $300,000 per year for the patient. Um, so the therapies I've seen so far have all been extremely expensive. Nothing like, you know, in the case of diabetes, we're talking about very in, relatively inexpensive medications. The problem is the diabetes population is so large that it becomes very expensive for the population as a whole. But um, I have told my, um, the, the, my team in my office that if I get shot at a public event, it will be at one of these meetings because I have seen some very angry people at these meetings. Um, and um, 
it, you know, we as a country have to decide whether or not we're going to continue rationing care at the bedside as we are. Doctors are having to make prior authorization requests and, and having to fight for pa individual patients to get coverage. Or do we have some central role by the payer? that They're probably making decisions as well, uh, not explicitly. Um, and um, so, uh, but this is kind of an amazing um, opportunity to see what it's like. And actually, if it's if the meetings are ever in Chicago, I'd welcome you to attend. They're open to the public, um, and and I'll probably be there um, scared. Um, um, but um, this is this, but this is uh, an attempt to try to operationalize and turn cost effectiveness analysis into real policy action. And one of the uh, evaluations of cystic fibrosis drugs actually did lead to a formal hearing in front of the New York Medicaid um, pa uh, insurance panel uh, where they're instituting an annual review of high cost drugs requiring the manufacturer to explain themselves why the drug has to be as expensive as it is. Um, and actually, uh, our work in this area is, is really, um, I, I think it's just taking off. And what's really exciting is that um, in the area of diabetes, that Nita Light Terapog is leading this, this large team of investigators to build really what is going to be the first American multi-ethnic uh, model of type 2 diabetes. All the prior examples I showed you before are based on British populations. 90% white. So really odd that we've been using those uh, models to uh, estimate the value of therapies in a multi-ethnic country like ours. And so she's going to account for uh, Asians, Latinos, African Americans, and also try to account for all the new drugs that we have available to, uh, to treat diabetes. So, you know, our... Actually, not, I did not talk about that. That's another topic. But actually, conveniently, Dr. Light Chirpong also leads our behavioral health interventions, too. So you could actually talk to her about that. Uh, maybe we, there's some way to fold that into this analysis. But I did not talk about behavioral health interventions at all. Um, and these are all the uh, investigators in your Chicago. Uh, at Newark, University of Washington, and Oxford, and Kaiser Northern California that uh, are part of this larger team evaluating uh, diabetes and its costs. So thank you, um, and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> I don't want to... <laughs> Sorry. Should I go ahead? Um, Quick question about that uh, number of, of seven for the hemoglobin A1C. Have, did I ever hear you talk about an evaluation of whether that was the right number, or how is that the, does it depend on a person's point in their life, or is that, is that the yeah, number I didn't, show, I didn't show that, but yeah, we've interrogated that quite, quite a bit. Um, uh, and um, so certainly for older people, we have a paper where we looked at older people who are uh, by age and by how sick they are. And the sicker somebody is, the older someone is, the less likely that A1Cs of seven are actually um, valuable, uh, beneficial or valuable. And, um, and that actually has led to change. That actually is partly the, why the, 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 the diabetes guidelines for older people actually changed in 2012 because of that. I wrote them. Great talk. What? what are they now? For the sickest, less than 8.5. Middle health, less than 8. And for the healthiest older person, less than 7.5. That's a great talk, Albert. I was wondering, um, I know the Wall Street Journal did an analysis or, or published an analysis recently looking at sort of single payer universal health care. I'm just wondering in diabetes, has that ever looked at so where the government is buying in bulk these expensive medicines and what the price um, point would be if government was buying in bulk and covering citizens with single payer? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to answer your question directly, but uh, I'll, I'll answer it by talking about just what other countries do in terms of drug prices. They basically have far more government intervention around prices. They have complete, they have, the government plays a big role in setting prices for, uh, for medications. Um, and the United States just does not play a role at all. We let the free market, as it is, decide the price. 
So, um, uh, so the prices of things in Japan are ridiculously low. The prices of, of drugs in um, Canada, that's why people are talking about by just going ahead and bypassing the United States and buying drugs from Canada. So I, I'm not sure your uh, question about a conversion to a single payer would, um, uh, would, without other changes, would result in lower prices. The VA is actually a good example of a universal health system uh, where they're actually able to negotiate with, uh, and they actually they get much lower prices because they are able to buy in bulk. Medicare, for whatever reason, is, well, we know it's, it's legislated to not negotiate uh, on, on price. I don't know why, um, but um, if it could, it might actually lower prices. Um, and the last, uh, amazing you stayed as long as you did. Uh, last thing is that we host a monthly workshop on, on, on these sort of topics. Uh, so please contact me or Aviva Nathan if you're interested in attending the monthly workshop. But thank you for your attention. I went crazy. I went crazy.